All right. In this video, this is Mike and Tate again. We'll go over a quick approach to uh, answering questions and how to tackle incorrects. So in general, so when you're answering practice questions, you want to really think through for any pathologies you're struggling with, you want to think about the next best step in the acute setting. So if a patient is decompensating, what's the first thing you want to do? Usually that boils down to the ABCs, airway, breathing, circulation. So usually, you know, manage the airway with intubation or CPAP or BiPAP or putting in IV fluids. And then you want to also think about management or guidance in the chronic setting, and then what risk factors exist for this condition. So that's really just for pathologies that you're learning for the first time that you haven't seen before. If you're struggling with practice questions about them, you want to think about these things that you're studying. Now, when you're actually doing the question themselves, you really want to just put yourselves in the perspective of the question writer. What are they trying to assess from you in this question? So the way I do that is by reading the first and the last sentence. So when I read the first sentence, I think about who is the patient and what do you need to know? You know, when we were kids, we all learned how to write a story, right? Who, what, where, when, why. So that's what I really think about when I read the first sentence. I get the demographic, I get what they're presenting for, the chief complaint, and then I form a differential diagnosis. Then I read the last sentence because sometimes you'll read a really long sent really long passage. You get to the bottom and it'll say, what's the mechanism of action of this drug? It'll be the joxin or something. So you'll be like, I just spent all this time diagnosing this patient with heart failure, and now they're decompensating. I was you know, you're always thinking about your differential going through, and then they'll be like, this patient is in heart failure. What's the mechanism of the joxin? Or something like that. So that's why I just read the last sentence right away as well, just to prime where the question is going. And then once I have my differential after reading the first question, I just finish reading the rest of the question and I'm able to just look at pertinent positives and negatives, just like in real life and narrow my differential down until hopefully I have a single one or two diagnoses. So again, the order of operations I use are reading the first and last sentence to determine the objective of the question. Then you want to triage your patient. Are they stable or unstable? Because that will really uh, determine what your immediate treatment will be. Then you want to form your differential based on the data, namely the first sentence. And then you want to choose the best next steps based on your decision and what you think the diagnosis is. A general tip for exams is that the cheaper and less invasive option is generally better, especially for stable patients. So after reading question, you should be able to basically do a, pre, a brief oral presentation to yourself, being able to say something like, this is a 50-year-old gentleman that was involved in a car crash. He has some signs of internal bleeding is unstable. So because he's unstable and has signs of trauma, he needs an aggressive management, meaning an exploratory laparotomy. So take and read our first practice question here and how we approach the method that I just talked about. Oh, I'm honored. I'm honored. So... Here's our first question. A 65-year-old woman, one-day status post-open appendectomy, complicated by perforation with peritonitis, presents with dyspnea and hypoxemia. Her past medical history includes hypothyroidism, SLE, CAD, breast adenocarcinoma, status post-resection and radiation 10 years ago. All right. Her hospital stay... I'm going to stop you there, Tate. Now let's read the last sentence. Wow, you got me with, my own, with our own strategy. What is the next best step in management, other than an IV bolus of fluids and continued antibiotics? Okay, so... What's our differential right now, Tate? I think I, I wrote this question a couple of years ago and I made it as hard as possible. I was going to say, I was like, man, this guy's wordy. All right. Um, my differential for this person with dyspnea and hypoxemia is extraordinarily broad. Mm -hmm. Um, so obviously you have like, you're in a hospital, so you could have like hospital acquired pneumonia. Um, you could have just like exacerbation of your already known, like heart disease. So it could be like a heart failure exacerbation. Um, she has a history of malignancy. So maybe she has some sort of effusion, uh, she has, it looks like the second sentence or third sentence has a lot more, you know, detail. So Mm -hmm. that's just initial thoughts. Yeah. And then I also included a history of lupus, likely on chronic prednisone. I think I include the chronic meds. So, and then the main thing was that she recently had a major surgery. So, you know, obviously atelectasis Mm. or pneumonia and then peritonitis as well. So there might've been Throw, throw PE in there extension. as well. Come on. Yeah. And PE. So basically everything. I made this question so hard that if you don't use the method we taught, it just demonstrates the power of the method that we talked about because we formed our differential and now we'll slowly work through it as we go. Without the diff without using this method, I remember I brought it into a session and nobody got it right. You crazy. Yeah, it was hard. All right. I wrote up Well, the hardest thing I could think of.
Yeah, and, and it is a long question. This also kind of goes to show the efficiency of the first and last sentence thing, um, because I'm going to go through the next few sentences, and you're going to see how long this is in the video. So mm -hmm. past medical history includes hypothyroidism, SLE, CAD, breast adenocarcinoma, status post-resection, radiation 10 years ago. Her hospital stay has been complicated by gram-negative sepsis, requiring two liters of lactated ringers and antibiotics. Her current medications include IV, piperacillin, tazobactam, or zosin, vancomycin, home hydroxychloroquine, levothyroxine, subcutaneous enoxaparin. Her dyspnea began one hour ago, and you have been paged regarding an oxygen desaturation 85% 20 minutes ago, requiring two liters of oxygen by nasal cannula. Vitals are heart rate 110, temperature of 100.5, blood pressure 110 over 80, respiratory rate of 24, oxygen saturation of 82%, and she's on four liters of nasal cannula. Your exam reveals JVP 7 centimeters without change on inspiration, increased work of breathing, bilateral lung crackles on auscultation. Um, Dorsalis pedis and radial pulses are two plus bilaterally. Cardiac exam reveals two out of six systolic ejection murmur over the upper right sternal border without additional heart sounds. ABG reveals a PAO2 of 59, PCO2 of 51. Other than an IV bolus of additional fluids and continued antibiotics, what is the next best step in management? Holy. I'm out of breath. Yeah. All right. So let's just work through our differential. So we got paged. So they're first of all, they're not in home prednisone. So you know, if one of the things that worries me, especially on step two, if I see a patient with a room history and all of a sudden they're desatting or they are hypotensive, I always think about uh, uh, adrenal insufficiency. But I see they're not on home prednisone. So already I think that's um, off the off the table. And then I see that they are on subcutaneous enoxaparin. So there that lowers my suspicion for pulmonary embolus, which is also a differential. Now, it could be atelectasis, right? Because this was one day ago, her um, open appendectomy. But what kind of leans me away from that is atelectasis alone really shouldn't make you this sick, right? Because I know we don't use SERS criteria all the time now, but SERS criteria is really good for exam purposes. Tate, do you remember what SERS criteria are? I think it's heart rate greater than 90, leukocytosis with left shift, fever, uh, and then hypotension are all in SERS criteria. So this patient obviously has SERS criteria and they're requiring a lot new of new oxygen requirements and they have bilateral crackles. So there's really only a couple of things that can cause this complete constellation of symptoms. And then the fact they're giving me an ABG, it, it makes me think, and this PAO2, if you were to look, would be low, right, Tate? Uh, yes, it would be. You're yeah. Right. So this PAO2 would be low and you, you, they would give you the value. So this would, there's only a couple of things that would really present with this clinical constellation. Um, basically like new onset pneumonia is possible. Um, and then heart failure is less likely because that really shouldn't be causing fever. Pulmonary embolus can cause fever, but this patient's on home anoxaparin. And then the other thing, which I think is what is like the likely diagnosis is sepsis with complicated by ARDS as well. But either way, even if you don't have the diagnosis, you know for this patient that they are desatting and they need um, IV, so they're septic. So they need IV fluid resuscitation and a continued antibiotics, but they also need to get that PAO2 up somehow um, because they're only satting 82% and they have a true hypoxemia by ABG. So that will help you as you read through the answers. So let's go through the answers, Tate. A, spiral CT. So when will we do spiral CT? I thought she had a pulmonary embolism. Okay. Do we think she has a PE? Less likely because of the anoxaparin. Yeah, I think probably not. Uh, and because that really shouldn't put you into serious criteria with like all these clinical findings, although it would be consistent. So I think I would say probably not, but we'll leave it on the list. B, IV hydrocortisone. So this would be if we think that this patient's going through adrenal insufficiency. I think that's pretty unlikely given that she's not on prednisone at home. So I, I would probably cross this off. I'd say no. Nah. All right, C, administration, positive pressure, the airway. I think this would be the right answer because, again, this patient's kind of unstable. We need to do the ABCs, which is airway, breathing, circulation. And this patient is desatting a nasal cannula. So we want to escalate this patient to positive pressure and then possible intubation if they still have a respiratory failure. So I would leave C open. D, C, T of the abdomen with and without contrast. What do you think, Tate? Um, something to consider, at least if you were considering like a reperf or something causing the sepsis, but it really doesn't explain the, the huge amount of respiratory distress that we have seen here. Right. The other thing is, even if you did a CT right now, this patient's unstable. So you want to stabilize the patient before obtaining any further imaging. You don't want them to be in a CT scanner and then the radiologist has to run a code. So I would cross this one off. And then IV norepi infusion. Um, this patient is normal tensive, 110 over 80, maybe a little bit soft, but they don't require pressors yet. So I'd probably cross this off. So all we're left with is 
either a spiral CT or a C, administration of positive pressure. And uh, which would you lean towards, Tate? I'd probably aim at the positive pressure just to kind of help with the hypoxemia. Yeah, I totally agree. I think that's the right answer. Do you want to go to the next slide? Let's see. Oh, and Oh, here's nice the chest shadow x-ray. image. How about that? Yeah, very nice. Yeah, very nice. So that's... Uh... Oh, wow, they're going to go into practice question two before even giving the answer to one. What a cliffhanger. Oh, yeah. Sometimes I link these questions up, especially on step three more, but I don't remember if they do it on step two, but sometimes I link up the questions. So what's the most under, what's the most likely underlying cause of this patient's condition? A, decreased cardiac contractility. B, adrenal failure from prolonged steroid use. C, occlusion of the pulmonary artery. D, cytokine release and inflammation from acute insult. Or D, acute myocardial ischemia. So let's just say quick what each of these refer to. A is decreased cardiac contractility would be more consistent with heart failure. B, adrenal failure from prolonged steroid use would be more consistent with adrenal insufficiency. C, occlusion of the pulmonary artery would be a PE. And now they've already given you the chest x-ray. We know that it's consistent with ARDS. So D, cytokine release and inflammation from acute insult is the correct answer. This would be consistent with ARDS in the setting of any insult like pancreatitis or sepsis. Or E, acute myocardial ischemia. That'd be consistent with the MI uh, or heart attack, but it doesn't, nothing in this picture is pointing us that way. All I right. like it. I like it a lot. Yeah. So So there's C two and D. answers. Right on. Ooh, how about that? Sweet. So look at that. I'll let you read this one. Uh, no, no, we can just uh, let, you can pause it if you want to read it because we basically talked through it. But basically, in this sense, we just worked through everything else and we know that. Uh, that this more consists of ARDS. For those of you who like are really on the grind boat and are really working hard, you can do the math and you know that um, ARDS can be diagnosed with uh, SpO2 to FiO2 ratio of 82% uh, or of um, less than 300. So you would see that this patient had a SpO2 about pulse ox of 82% and then they're on four liters. So you, you would take 0.21 which is room air plus four times 0.4. And that would give you 221 in total. So that would give you SpO2 to FiO2 ratio of less than 300. But I, the, the point of this question actually was to show you that you could get this question right even without knowing that. So one thing I see people like kind of, a lot of test taking is a mental game. I'd say almost most of it is. So some people are like, oh, I don't know every equation and I don't know all the formulas. and every single you know risk factor for this diagnosis. So now I'm really concerned I won't do well and I don't think I could get this question right. So they almost give up on the question right away when they see it. But a lot of times the exam will give you enough information to solve the question just based on clinical gestalt, even if you don't know all the specifics of the numbers. I had a buddy that did no Anki, um, just did UWorld and clinical gestalt. He wasn't able to name me a lot of the diagnoses and things like that, but he still got a 262 just based on clinical gestalt alone, basically. You worked with him, Tate. Andy. That was Andy. Oh, good guy. Good Yeah, guy. that's how he operated. But he, he, I mean, he knew, he learned everything. He just didn't use like the active recall as much. So he couldn't name things off the top of his head. But he would always just use his clinical gestalt and what he knew about his understanding of each organ system to help him with his answers. All right, now we'll just do a quick session uh, on how to evaluate incorrects. So. Step one, try not to get the question wrong, though I won't spend too long on that. But if you just take your time on each question and really give each question your best effort, then you won't have to review it as an incorrect. And then just make sure you get the basics. So read the question carefully, highlight the key information and abnormal uh, lab findings, and then use the preferred method to analyze your case. But really make sure you have a system for doing so. I would highly recommend our system, which is just reading the first and then the last sentence right away before reading the answers and the rest of the question. I think that's a really good protocol and just helps you. I think that's the most applicable method for the uh, clinical setting as well. And then if you get a question, even if you get a question wrong due to a knowledge gap, uh, you'll learn more if you understand the question itself. So what I mean by that is you really want to make sure you understand what the question is asking you. And then even if you get the question wrong, you'll understand the key takeaway point that the examiners are trying to assess. All right. And then the second step is to identify why you got the question wrong. So did you misread the question? Have you never heard of the pathology? Or maybe you knew the pathology, not the management, or maybe you knew the pathology management, but not prevention. So it's always just about the levels of your understanding of a certain concept. And you really want to be just understanding the pathology management prevention of every topic if you're trying to score well on these exams. And then you just want to use this part to identify your learning gap and study appropriately. So hopefully you got the question wrong because you didn't know something. The worst way to get a question wrong is because you misread something. That's kind of 
uh, level one. Level two is if you didn't know something, and this is e more easy to remediate because you just need to either read the UWorld explanation if that's sufficient and you're comfortable with that, you can move on. Otherwise, you can look at other resources like Amboss and First Aid or go through the Anki cards to cover that gap in knowledge. Uh, and then we'll do one more practice question. Um, you can skip this if you don't want to listen, but we'll just, Tate and I will just do a quick, this one's a lot easier. So let's say 58 year, year old gentleman presenting the ch uh, ED for sudden chest pain that started two hours ago. What's your differential for chest pain, Tate, real quick? That's well, like endless. You can have MI and PE, pericarditis, pneumonia, esophageal stuff like GERD. That's just a few. All right, that's perfect. So that, that's our differential for now. And then we read the last sentence. EKG shows ST cell segment elevation leads to 3 AVF and ST segment depression leads 1 in AVL. What's the next best step manage, in management of this patient? So honestly, you don't even need to read the rest of the question, but we should. So now we know they have basically an inferior STEMI. So let's say, so he describes a pain of 8 out of 10, rating to his neck, he has a history of hypertension, blood pressure. So is this important? You need to see the vitals of every patient. Never skip the vitals of a patient, ever, ever, even in real life. Blood pressure, 86 over 60, so a little bit soft. Uh, Low-grade tachycardia, 90. Respiratory rate's okay, static, 96%. Physical exam, cool extremities, clear lungs. Auscultation with regular bradycardic rhythm. It should be normal, um, regular rate and rhythm. He shouldn't be bradycardic. And then JVP is a little bit elevated. Um, so what's the next best step in treatment of this patient? So already without reading the question, what do we think the answer will be, Tate? For a inferior infarct, I would go with B. You want to administer IV fluids. Yeah, so sometimes in these questions, I try to get the answer before I uh, get my own answer before I even read the answers they give us. And I would say, I would have said like give IV fluids. So I actually look at the question right away and I see give IV fluids. So I'm like, that's probably the answer. And then I read the rest just really quick. So sublingual nitrogen, nope, contraindicated. C, IV morphine, also contraindicated because it's a vasodilator. Dopamine infusion, he doesn't need that. He just needs fluids. And then carvedilol, uh, you don't want to give metoprolol or uh, any beta blocker like carv carvedilol or metoprolol when they're already hypotensive at this point. So, yep, IV fluids. Very good. All right. Something to keep in mind also, guys, administer IV fluids is a fantastic answer on most questions. I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, I agree. All right. I think that's all we got. This is a little answer explanation. We already kind of walked through it, though. So, um, good. And then we'll talk about the analysis framework. So, there's a quick analysis framework, just like we talked about. Again, number one, what was the question trying to assess? Two, why did I get the question wrong? Three, have I seen this topic before and what's the learning gap? And four, what can I learn from this question and how do I reinforce the knowledge? So, for this question, what was this question trying to assess? This was trying to assess your understanding of inferior MI. So there are a couple of different reasons you could get this question wrong. Question wrong. One is that you just didn't pay attention that this was inferior MI. So you're like, oh, this is MI. Let's just give nitroglycerin. So that's the worst way to get a question wrong because you're just not even like reading the question fully and you're not going to get the full learning experience from that question. Level two, you didn't re recognize that this was an inferior MI. So you just had a learning gap. You knew this was an MI, but you didn't realize that leads two, three, and AVF were inferior leads. Um, and then level three, you recognize this was inferior, uh, an inferior MI, but you didn't realize that the treatment of an inferior MI was IV fluids. So for each level, there's just a different level of uh, different next best next step you should take. So for level one, you just want to um, read closer attention and just you need to ask yourself if you would have gotten that question right if you had known it was an inferior MI. And levels two and three is just, you know, really bridging that learning gap. And then three, have I seen this topic before? And four, what can I learn from this question? So that just involves reading the learning objective and moving on. And this is a pretty basic question. So, all right. All right. Thanks for watching, guys. Thanks. Peace.